Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash adventures in audio. Over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Welcome, dear friends, to Adventures in Audio. I'm Robert Crandall, your host. Well, this is a sad time for me. I recently lost uh, some dear friends, three of them in the last year, and two within the last two weeks. My spoken buddy, J.C., died about a year ago. He was a cigar aficionado. I smoke a pipe. He worked at a tobacco store that sells cigars and pipe tobacco. And they have these comfortable sofas and comfy chairs and recliners and the big screen TV. And go in, watch a ball game and smoke with your friends. And it was a good time. I got busy and I hadn't been over to see him in probably seven or eight months. And then got a call that... He died. So the guilt trip sets in, and and I I miss him. I miss going there. I've been to the store a couple of times since, but it's not the same. Then the last two weeks here of, uh, uh, this is July, or no, now it's August. How time flies. It's August 4th, 2016. And about two weeks ago, a friend of mine named Chuck, whom uh, did the intro to the first three episodes of this podcast for me, died about two weeks ago. And the thing about that is uh, I knew him and JC. We all three worked at a radio station here in in Las Vegas together. And Chuck uh, knew I was doing some podcasting and asked me to show him. He wanted to, to do something. And so, you know, okay, and uh, I loaned him some equipment, a microphone and the interface to get the microphone into the computer, blah, blah, blah. And um, he had it a while, and I needed it back just temporarily, and so I called him and and uh, asked if I could get it back just temporarily, and I'd give it back to him. And so he, he returned it, and then when I was done with it, I called him back and said, hey, uh, uh, I'm finished with it. Now you can have it back. Give me a call. He never returned my call. I tried three times, four, three or four times, and he never returned my call. I guess he took offense that I wanted them back. I said temporarily, and and so that's how that ended. What a shame. We had been had we known known each other since. Uh, Gosh, I think uh, 87 or 88, something like that. I just, uh, well, anyway, that's how that one ended. And again, a little guilt trip there. I, you know, didn't mean to say, you know, and I didn't give me my stuff back. I just asked for it back. I needed it just for something I wanted to try. And I, I just, I, and I said, and then uh, you can have it back, you know, and. Anyway, and then probably my closest friend I've known through four-wheeling, um, which I was into for quite some time, and we would go out in the mountains and desert and so forth in our Jeeps and go out with some four-wheel drive clubs and stuff and had some great, great times and some harrowing, harrowing times. And uh, I remember once up in, we were up in around St. George, Utah, which is about two hours away from Las Vegas. And we were going up this mountain. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, a challenging off-road trail. It was kind of a road that went up this mountain, gravel and stuff. It wasn't really, we were just going up this and I was leading and uh, John was behind me, and our friend Mike was riding with John, and 
I got up to kind of this flat spot, a landing like, and uh, and I saw the road continue uh, on an incline to my left. So I I proceeded up the incline. Well, it was too steep of an incline, and my old Jeep uh, still had a carburetor and not fuel injection, and the incline was too steep, and it stalled. And I couldn't get it started. I was stuck up halfway up this hill. I looked out the window. I had, oh, my God, I had no idea that it was that steep. Uh, so I got on the CB. We always had CBs with us. I said, hey, I've got a problem. And they were right behind me. And they come up and said, oh, my God. And uh, so we, 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 it took us uh, quite a while to get, get me down off of that. We had to do it. So if I'd went over that landing, it was a 500 foot drop into a, a ravine. And uh, so we primed the carburetor and John was under the hood priming the car. We always carry gas with you and jerry cans and so forth. And, and, and I carried mine and instead of a five gallon jerry can, I carried two, two and a half gallon cans. They're easier to handle and it's strapped on the roof of the Jeep. And, and uh, so we were using that and John was priming the carburetor. We got it running. And uh, so I'd put it in reverse and, and, uh, go back two inches and slide two feet and it was really scary i didn't think it was going to stop sliding we did that a couple of times and john and mike are behind the my jeep with big rocks to throw it under the wheels if it didn't stop and uh we finally got it down and we're on this flat spot this landing if you will and we're all shaking, trying to calm our nerves. And I looked down over that drop. It was easily 500 feet or maybe even more. Had I went over that, I would have met a very, very violent and horrific, gruesome death. I don't know how they would ever get get me out of there if I, my, my corpse had just laid there and rotted probably. I, you know, it's like Mount Everest. There are climbers at Mount Everest who die and they just, it's too dangerous to try and get the body. I'm thinking that's probably, I don't know how they'd gotten down there. But anyway, so Mike and John saved my life. We got turned around, headed back down the mountain and the St. George. And I remember being up there on that hill and looking out and I could see the lights of St. George, Utah. That's how far up we were. Because we were well, quite a ways from St. George. And uh, <laughs> 10 miles, I mean, something like that. But we, So we got back to St. George, gassed up and shook off our nerves some more before the drive back to Vegas, which is about two hours. And uh, I remember coming up over a ridge when you're headed south on I-15 from St. George to Vegas. You come up over a ridge, and there in the distance is the whole city and its lights. From left to right, it's, it's, and it just fills up the, the horizon. And uh, I was never so glad to see those lights. And I just, oh, I'm almost home. I can relax, put on my smoking jacket, and fill a bowl of my pipe and a glass of wine. And uh, after a harrowing experience getting that down from that steep incline we were on. And so, and we had some other experiences too. That was probably the most, the scariest one. But And so Mike is in Idaho and John is somewhere else not with us anymore. He was cremated and um, we uh, used to have coffee at a, at a bar restaurant here in town. It was, we live far apart and uh, there was this bar that was pretty much halfway 
between us. So we met there once a week, normally on Tuesday for some reason. He had a stroke, a massive stroke back in April. And uh, at first he couldn't even go see him. And when I finally did, he looked like a dead man. His face was an ash colored. Looked like an ashtray or something. It was spooky. Couldn't talk. It was. <gasps> then finally um, he came home. Well, that happened. Like the stroke was in April, and th three or four weeks went by, and I said I, I should go down to the bar and let them know why we haven't been in. And so I did, and I walked in, and uh, and. Uh, the waitress who waited on us said, I, she says, what do we do to make you mad at us? And I explained to her what happened. She said, oh, my God, I hope he, I hope he recovers, blah, blah, blah. And uh, she said, I was, I was accusing everybody here of making you guys mad at us. <laughs> and uh, so that was, that was probably in early May or something, and I hadn't been in since. And then it was strange. Tuesday, which I believe was August 3rd or 2nd, maybe, just a couple of days ago, because this is being recorded now on uh, the 4th, and, and uh, I'm sitting here at my, my studio slash office, and I'm thinking, well, I don't have to go anywhere tonight, because I'm involved in a lot of, I get into these meetups. I'm sure you've seen them on, online. Um, anyway, I didn't have anywhere to go. I thought, wow, I'm free, free tonight. I can work here in my studio on some things that I need to get caught up on. My podcast and, and some other things. And, and then it struck me, something just said, wait, it's Tuesday. That's when John and I always met at the bar. You know what? I should go down there and tell the girls, the waitress and bartender, that he's that he's gone. And so I hopped in the car, went, drove down there. And uh, when you walk in the main door, you're in sort of a foyer, like a glass enclosed, with a door on the right that goes to the dining room, which is non-smoking, and then the door on the left goes into the bar area, uh, yeah, which is uh, smoking permitted. They, after 9 o'clock, it was after 9 p.m., yet they have to buzz you in. And the bartender wasn't, I didn't see her, and I didn't see the, the waitress that always waited on us. And then after about a minute, the waitress comes through the door from the kitchen. And I could see, and I saw her, and she, I, even from a distance, I saw a shot stunned kind of look on her face and she said something and the bartender's head shot up from below she was arranging bottles or something uh and the same look a shock look on her face and, but i mean more than just a surprise that you might expect because i hadn't been in and, and of course they knew the circumstances and they, or knew he was ill but it was more than just a surprise look was stunned, a shock. And it, it struck me as kind of strange. And so they, she buzzed me in and, and the bar, or the waitress came around and, and she looked, stared at me and, and said, well, how is he? And I said, he's dead. She, you know, I, I don't know why I had to be so morbid. I could say passed away, you know, but. I guess I've been reading too many horror stories or something. I said, oh, no. And her head, her head sunk, and she looked over to the bar, told the bartender he's dead. And oh, she was, we'd been going in there several years, a long time. And she looked at me and she said, you know, we were just thinking about you. And the bartender said, yeah, just not, not too long ago, within the hour. Even less than that. And I said, really? That's strange. Because I was sitting at home and 
didn't have anywhere to go tonight, so I was going to get to working on some things, and it struck me to come down here and 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 let you know about it. And just I thought about you guys just twenty minutes ago or something, or within the hour. With isn't that strange? Do you think John could have communicated to us at the same time, urging me to go? Do you believe in stuff like that? I mean, we we do stories of that kind on this podcast, ghost stories and stuff. Do you believe in that? Now, I, I was raised a Christian. I believe in God and heaven and hell and, and so forth. But, you know, some of these some of these things that you hear about people communicating with the dead or the dead communicating with the living and so forth. I, I'm a skeptic. You know, I hear stuff like that all the time, and I just just disregard it. And, but it's strange, isn't it? Strange. I mean, I was in a seance once, long, long time ago. Some guy said, oh, 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 and he got up and he ran out of the room. And it never did anything for me. Maybe I, my, my skepticism wouldn't let it or something. I don't know. But that was so strange. We were just thinking of you, and I was just thinking of them. I, I don't know. It's kind of uncanny. Yeah. So anyway, we chatted a little bit, and, and they, uh, she said, Mike, you want to stay for a cup of coffee? And I looked over at the table where we normally sat. I said, no, I can't right now. I just, no, nah, I got to go. So, okay, so we hugged, and it's been nice, and maybe one of these days I'll get in here. I don't normally get over to that part of town. It was just halfway for uh, John and I, and so it was a perfect spot. But I normally don't get over there that much, and so I probably won't be in. Uh, yeah aside from the memories and so forth. But so I walked out to my car and got in the car, backed up, looked at the building one last time, got out onto the street and headed home. Took this drive one more time. And it's a long drive. It's, quite a, it's a ways from where I live. And I got home. I pulled in the driveway and... Uh, Turned the ignition off, and I sat there for just a second and thought, the end, the end of a chapter. And so, dear friends, you are indeed dear friends. And I'm sorry to wear my heart out of my sleeve. You've probably been through it yourself. If not, you will. And uh, it's always, I guess, death is part of life. We're always going to lose friends or family members and so forth. And uh, I, it's just the way it goes. It's just this. I have other friends, but none of, uh, as close as, as uh, those three, especially John. So that's where I'm at. And I appreciate your listening to this podcast. It's not a vast audience. Uh, at all, and but it grows. There's more downloads every month, and I really don't do much marketing for it. It's kind of a practice thing, really, just to practice my long-form narration and multi-track audio production, which if you're not into that, don't know what I'm talking about. And if you are into it, then you know what I'm talking about. But uh, I really appreciate your listening. And, you know, something that's... Uh, it's pretty cool about the internet is there are listeners all over the world. I mean, the list of countries is, you know, in Europe and Asia and South America, Africa, all the continents are, uh, have, have listeners to this podcast. I, I just, that uh, thrills me. So you're very much appreciated. And I hope that, You'll continue to listen, and, you know, John was always, uh, 
pretty candid. He would say, well, that one, did, that, that one was no good. You need to do it over. <laughs> Not doing it over. They're too much work. <laughs> the way it turns out is the way it's going to stay. <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> and then he would also say, you know, oh, wow, that was a good one. That was a good one. He never pulled any punches. And your comments are always welcome, too, either on the website, adventuresinaudio.net, or, or my email is robert.c850 at uh, gmail.com. So uh, <sighs> that's where I'm at today. I hope things are, I hope you're in better spirits. Thank you for allowing me to wear my heart out on my sleeve. So let's get going with the story for this episode. Once again, I want to remind you of the free offer from audible.com. Just for signing up for their free 30-day trial, you'll receive a free audiobook. Choose from over 150,000 titles in any genre you want. You'll find audiobooks for the kids and teens, and if you like horror stories like the ones on this podcast, they have them and lots of them. The author of this story on this episode is Richard Middleton, and some of the titles you'll find at audible.com with, with his work. One is called Voices of the, Gro uh, Voices of the Ghost, two. Mysterious Meetings, Ghost Stories by Mary E. Williams, Richard Middleton, Amelia B. Edwards. There's another one called The Great Ghost Story Collection, Over 40 Spooky Tales. Richard Middleton, E.F. Benson, Robert E. Howard, M.R. James. That should be a good one. Another one is Unlikely Stories, 44 Tales of the Weird and Fantastical. Edith Wharton, Richard Middleton, uh, W.F. Harvey, Thomas Hardy, and more. Another one is British Classic Stories. Richard Middleton and, and Eleanor Smith and some others. Then The Ghost Ship, which is one of his uh, standalone books. And uh, The Coffin Merchant, that's Richard Middleton also. And they also have the one we're doing on this podcast called On the Brighton Road. And, of course, they have all the, all the others, Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft and uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. You know, if you like, uh, I'm sure they, they have all the Sherlock Holmes and his non-Sherlock Holmes work as well. It's all there, everything you could want. And you get a free audio book just for signing up for a 30-day free trial. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash adventures in audio and sign up. And we would appreciate it. In the story for this episode, a man is walking along a road and is suddenly joined by an 18-year-old boy who suggests they are dead. I hope you enjoy On the Brighton Road by Richard Middleton. Slowly the sun had climbed up the hard white downs till it broke with little of the mysterious ritual of dawn upon a sparkling world of snow. There had been a hard frost during the night, and the birds who hopped about here and there with scant tolerance of life left no trace of their passage on the silver pavements. In places the sheltered caverns of the hedges broke the monotony of the whiteness that had fallen upon the colored earth and overhead the sky melted from orange to deep blue, from deep blue to a blue so pale that it suggested a thin paper screen rather than illimitable space. Across the level fields there came a cold, silent wind, which blew a fine dust of snow from the trees, but hardly stirred the crested hedges. Once above the skyline, the sun seemed to climb more quickly, 
and as it rose higher it began to give out a heat that blended with the keenness of the wind. It may have been this strange alternation of heat and cold that disturbed the tramp in his dreams, for he struggled for a moment with the snow that covered him, like a man who finds himself twisted uncomfortably in the bedclothes, and then sat up with staring, questioning eyes. Lord, I thought I was in bed, he said to himself as he took in the vacant landscape. And all the while, I was out here. He stretched his limbs, and rising carefully to his feet, shook the snow off his body. As he did so, the wind set him shivering, and he knew that his bed had been warm. Come, I feel pretty fit, he thought. I suppose I'm lucky to wake at all in this, or unlucky. It isn't much of a business to come back to. He looked up and saw the downs shining against the blue, like the Alps on a picture postcard. That means another forty miles or so, I suppose. He continued grimly. Lord knows what I did yesterday. Walked till I was done, and now I'm only about twelve miles from Brighton. Damn the snow. Damn Brighton. Damn everything. The sun crept higher and higher, and he started walking patiently along the road with his back turned to the hills. I'm glad or sorry that it was only sleep that took me. Glad or sorry. Glad or sorry. His thoughts seemed to arrange themselves in a metrical accompaniment to the steady thud of his footsteps, and he hardly sought an answer to his question. It was good enough to walk to. Presently, when three milestones had loitered past, he overtook a boy who was stooping to light a cigarette. He wore no overcoat and looked unspeakably fragile against the snow. Are you on the road, governor? asked the boy huskily as he passed. I think I am, the tramp said. Oh, then I'll come a bit of the way with you if you don't walk too fast. It's a bit lonesome walking this time of day, the tramp nodded his head, and the boy started limping along by his side. I'm eighteen, he said casually. I bet you thought I was younger. Fifteen, I'd have said. You'd have backed a loser. Eighteen last August, and I've been on the road six years. I ran away from home five times when I was little and... The police took me back each time. Very good to me, the police was. Now I haven't got a home to run away from. Nor have I, the tramp said calmly. Oh, I can see what you are, the boy panted. You're a gentleman come down. It's harder for you than me. The tramp glanced at the limping, feeble figure and lessened his pace. I haven't been at it as long as you have, he admitted. No, I could tell by the way you walk. You haven't got tired yet. Perhaps you expect something on the other end. The tramp reflected for a moment. I don't know, he said bitterly. I'm always expecting things. You'll grow out of that, the boy commented. It's warmer in London, but it's hard to come by grub. There isn't much in it, really. Still, there's a chance of meeting somebody there who will understand. Country people are better, the boy interrupted. Last night I took a lease of a barn for nothing and slept with the cows, and this morning the farmer routed me out and gave me tea and toke because I was so little. Of course, I score there, but in London, soup on the embankment at night and all the rest of the time coppers moving you on. I dropped by the roadside last night and slept where I fell. It's a wonder I didn't die, the tramp said. The boy looked at him sharply. How do you know you didn't, he said. I don't see it, the tramp said after a pause. I tell you, the boy said hoarsely. People like us can't get away from this sort of thing if we want to. Always hungry and thirsty and dog-tired and walking all the while. 
and yet if anyone offers me a nice home and work, my stomach feels sick. Do I look strong? I know I'm little for my age, but I've been knocking about like this for six years. And do you think I'm not dead? I was drowned bathing at Margate, and I was killed by a gypsy with a spike. He knocked my head, and yet I'm walking along here now, walking to London, to walk away from it again, because I can't help it. Dead! I tell you, we can't get away if we want to. The boy broke off in a fit of coughing, and the tramp paused while he recovered. You'd better borrow my coat for a bit, Tommy, he said. Your cough is pretty bad. You go to hell, the boy said fiercely, puffing at his cigarette. I'm all right. I was telling you about the road. You haven't got down to it yet, but you'll find out presently. We're all dead, all of us. We're on it, and we're all tired, yet somehow we can't leave it. There's nice smells in the summer, dust and hay and the wind smack in your face on a hot day, and it's nice waking up in the wet grass on a fine morning. I don't know. I don't know. He lurched forward suddenly and the tramp caught him in his arms. I'm sick, the boy whispered. Sick. The tramp looked up and down the road, but he could see no houses or any sign of help. Yet even as he supported the boy doubtfully, in the middle of the road a motor car suddenly flashed in the middle distance and came smoothly through the snow. What's the trouble? said the driver quietly as he pulled up. I am a doctor. He looked at the boy keenly and listened to his strained breathing. Pneumonia, he commented. I'll give him a lift to the infirmary. And you too, if you'd like. The tramp thought of the workhouse and shook his head. I'd rather walk, he said. The boy winked faintly as they lifted him into the car. I'll meet you beyond Rygate, he murmured to the tramp. You'll see. And the car vanished along the white road. All the morning the tramp splashed through the thawing snow. But at midday he begged some bread at a cottage door and crept into a lonely barn to eat it. It was warm in there, and after his meal he fell asleep among the hay. It was dark when he woke and started trudging once more through the slushy roads. Two miles beyond Rygate, a figure, a fragile figure, slipped out of the darkness to meet him. On the road, governor, said a husky voice. Then I'll come a bit of the way with you if you don't walk too fast. It's a bit lonesome walking this time of day. But the pneumonia cried the tramp, aghast. I died at Crawley this morning, said the boy. You've been listening to On the Brighton Road by Richard Middleton. I enjoyed being with you, and now I must leave. But I'll be back. I hope all is well. Thank you 